This is the street that was never developed because it's too steep and it was just overgrown. And so the community had an idea and they terraced the whole thing by hand, turned it into a community garden. This is another hillside uh, next to housing for low-income immigrants from Southeast Asia, from Vietnam and Cambodia, and they terraced their hillside to create a community garden. We now have 85 community gardens in the city of Seattle, 7,000 urban gardeners. They donate 10 tons of produce to our food banks every year, and it's all been through bottom-up action. This is at one of our community gardens where they wanted to turn an old story shed into a community uh, meeting place. Uh, they wanted to have restrooms. Park department said, you can't do it. They'll just get vandalized. The community said, we're going to make these restrooms so nice, people are going to treat them with respect. People donated their leftover mosaic tile, their broken dishes, and they created these mosaic patterns inside their toilets. Been there for seven years, absolutely no vandalism. Kids who were busted for graffiti are now creating murals to uh, cover those graffiti-covered walls in a program through which uh, 5,000 kids who've been through the court system have an option to, uh, 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 another option, which is to help create murals throughout the city, have now created 1,500 murals throughout the city of Seattle. This is a business district that was totally boarded up. This uh, block had been uh, boarded up for 15 years. We couldn't get businesses to come in. So finally the community organized and said, well, if we can't get real businesses, let's pretend. <laughs> so we painted all the boarded up doors and windows to make it look like there were businesses. People got excited. Cars were stopping. People wanted to get out and shop. <laughs> Within a year, we had to take down every one of the murals because real businesses wanted to get in on the action. So this is what it looked like one year later with uh, all new businesses. There are now no empty storefronts in Columbia City. This is under the Aurora Bridge in Fremont neighborhood where they're having a terrible problem with illegal dumping, with lots of drug dealing going on. Any other neighborhood would put up fencing to close it off. Fremont, they had a better idea. We'll install a troll. <laughs> that troll's been so popular, it brings legitimate traffic now from absolutely all over the world. This is the Eritrean community that came together to build their own cultural center to, because they were afraid they were losing their kids to the streets and a way to keep them in their culture, to keep them within their community and support them. We find our strongest communities in Seattle are our immigrant communities. But then communities said, you know, we're putting all our, this matching fund is fantastic. It's great. We love it. The problem is we only have access to a small share of the city's resources with a matching fund. And we're often focused on single projects. And if we just focus on single projects, sometimes we're inadvertently uh, gentrifying the neighborhood, like in Columbia City. Or we worked hard to drive the drug dealers out of our neighborhood. Where'd they go? We need to take a more holistic perspective. So they pushed for a neighborhood planning program. And they said neighborhood planning will also be a way to leverage the city's resources to make sure the city's budget is responsive to our community's priorities. Because it's not enough just to focus on our own assets in the community, we also need to make sure that the government's responsive to our communities. So we started an unprecedented bottom-up planning program where we provided money to neighborhood groups where they could hire their own planners who were accountable to the neighborhood. But we only gave them the money once they had all of the stakeholders at the table from the community and they had a plan for how to, how to involve the entire community in the planning process. So uh, our mayor at that time said, we're leading the genie out of the bottle, we'll never get it back in. He understood the risk he was taking, that the, and, uh, uh, but was willing to take that risk. 30,000 people got involved in this neighborhood planning process. 38 neighborhood plans resulted. There were over 5,000 specific recommendations. But because there was a huge constituency for these plans, because people understood the plans, they weren't allowed to sit on the shelf. People held government accountable for implementing those plans. So the city reorganized into six sectors, creating interdepartmental teams to, to fold neighborhood recommendations into department work programs and department budgets. And through that, we carried out a lot of the recommendations. And then we started building bond measures and levies around what the people had asked for in their plans, rather than what the politicians said was important. We looked at what the neighborhoods had said was important. People said, we want new parks. We want new libraries. We want new community centers. People voted for $468 million additional dollars, taxed themselves additional money for the things they'd asked for. Democracy works. People are going to vote for new taxes if it's their idea. But the best thing that happened out of the neighborhood plans was that people took ownership for them themselves. They took responsibility for, for a lot of the implementation because, again, there's so much communities can do better than government. And so out of, uh, at that time was when our mayor tripled the neighborhood matching funds so that there'd be a lot more capacity to do community self-help projects. 
uh, and those are now happening all across uh, the city of Seattle. So in, in conclusion, I think the hallmarks of effective community partnership are one, that it needs to be neighborhood or community focused so that it's accessible, culturally appropriate, and holistic. Secondly, that it needs to be asset based, not only focusing on the community strength, but making underutilized agency resources available to help support community priorities. And third, that it needs to be community driven. Uh, promote inclusive democratic associations and empower community in every aspect, planning, decision making, implementation, and evaluation. This program is now not unique to Seattle. There are now neighborhood matching funds in Kobe, Japan, in Port Elizabeth, South Africa, in uh, Dublin, Ireland, in um, uh, Sydney, Australia. There's bottom-up planning all over the state of Victoria and Australia. It's a, it's a growing movement where governments are, are starting to understand they can't do it by themselves. They can't do it in a top-down approach, but by involving the community, the power expands, and you're able to do so much more. So thank you. Thank you.